Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co host. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Kicking off, you know, Adrian's here hanging out with just another kill team podcast and we've yeah, got what's up. he's been playing corsairs locally for a while on the trying while well, trying to figure out whether or not you want to play commandos with all the nerfs hey oh no i'm I'm taking a break from them for a while bro for a while they're they're on the they're on the bench for a hard year unless there's some serious thing that comes up where i need to dust them off and take them out of retirement but no, i'm i they had they had their run last year and they had their fun it was a great one. Oh, like they i'm did, curious they did what do you think about all the nerfs? Like, do you think they can still kind of hang or are they pretty done? You know, it's pretty funny. Like, I've, I've actually kind of been taking sort of a self-imposed, like, vacation after after the uh, the whole grind that was last year, especially the final push with LVO and all that. Um, I think, I mean, a lot of people in some tiers list are still saying they can hang. I'm of the, like, I, ha- I haven't played him yet. So I think I am just theorizing at this point. I think they're still probably good. I don't think they're, you know, my gut tells me they're not as oppressive as as they were, especially the biggest nerf, I think, is the chopper nerf, to be honest. Like, that that you feel a lot, because, like, four attacks hitting on threes was already, like, eh, so-so, and now missing out on that is, like, is like a pretty big, is a pretty big change. So I've heard some people talk about sledgehammers, which maybe messes with your equipment points. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's fine overall. I think they're still in a decent spot, but I don't, I don't think they're, I think you're going to have to work a lot harder for your wins now. Um, whereas before some of them came a little bit easy and some of them at the top tiers were still tough. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think they're probably fine, but then again, that's all basically going off of me not playing them yet. Cause like I said, I'm sort of on a self-imposed hiatus and I'm just really trying to explore new teams and just take a step back and connect with my roots in this game and just having fun and playing some fun teams and doing some different stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, think- For any listeners that don't already know, this is Adrian, who was the 2023 world champ playing commandos, crushing everybody with these green skinned villains. Uh, yeah, he won the menace he's, last he's, year. Yep, he's moving on, exploring other teams. Um, one of which is Corsairs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been having uh, well, Corsairs are interesting because I tried them out uh, like literally like a year ago, a little over a year ago this time before going to what was it, KTO, right? And uh, I think it was March ish or something mm-hmm. last year. So I oh, that was KTO that was last year like, was uh, February. Right, so Kill Team so Open was, has traditionally been a very early event. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like I was still pretty green as a competitive player by my own standards, and I was coming into my own and getting you know know more more meticulous in terms of my play and i did well locally and took him to kto and i was not ready i was not ready to play corsairs uh, and it did not go well um but now i've kind of come back to them uh because i have them they're painted uh they're beautifully commissioned painted by a local player of ours alex shout out alex from jersey does an amazing job um on the bstrat discord but yeah they're they're just like really they're really fun they're it's like a tightrope walk. If if you make one mistake, you're like, oh, that doesn't feel good. And if you make two mistakes, like you're like, all right, that's probably the game. The game's over. So every operative is a superhero. Every operative can do crazy stuff. Whatever they are good at, they can do really well. Some of these operatives have pseudo four or five APL when they do all their trips and and sorry, tricks and jumps and flips and free mission actions and double shoot or or whatever. Um, so they feel really cool, but it is kind of like playing on a knife's edge. Um, so it's been, it's been an interesting challenge and a lot of the games have been like really close and it felt like really rewarding to play and really rewarding when you win. Cause you know, it's kind of like you've wrangled the team and like done a really good job and executed as opposed to just like, I've just stat check people and, you know, I, I have some very good ploys that are just solid, you know? Yeah, because Corsairs really don't have a ton of rerolls baked into their sheets. So you really do need to land your shots at the right time. And even if you land your shots, you were saying one or two mistakes and the game is over. Sometimes the mistake is, oh, I took a 
reliable shot and I rolled two two hits. 100%. Sometimes the mistake is I'm going to move dash and shoot the space marine in the face with my melted pistol and my shuriken pistol with, you know, the outcast's reroll and nothing happens and you're like, well, now that guy's dead and that's probably the game. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you save your CP for a lot of dice r- rolls. I will say that rolling natural sixes with the team is such a high. Like, it feels <laughs> it feels awesome. It feels like how dice rolling should be. Because when you get your six, then it's rending, and then it's a crit, and then you get a miss, turns into a hit, and it just, like, this team pops off. So when this team rolls good, and when you make your four-up saves, and when you hit your crits on shooting, like, they're good. But long-term viability in terms of, like, an event tournament you know that's you're just you're praying to the dice gods and that's that's where they i think they struggle over, over the the long term yeah you know, three four five six games that is kind of like the ultimate like internet opinion about it which actually led to one of my pre-written questions and i think you kind of already answered it but maybe maybe a little extra nugget will come up when i ask it um they are known to be unreliable what's your biggest tool to mitigate that? And you already kind of mentioned like savings for some rerolls, but do you ever right. like think about, do you play differently because of the lack of reliability? I think I do. I think, I mean, saving CP for rerolls whenever you can is, is definitely a must is, you know, maybe one or two CP for those key moments. Um, but I think I am also, I'm like a very conservative player when I play competitively. So I've also struggled a little bit with the tack ops because like surge forward and escort operative. A lot of times I'm only scoring one inch of those on turn four because turn three, I just kind of have to stick people's necks out a little bit too much for my liking. Um, But yeah, so to answer your question, the way I play, I try to just not give my opponent anything at all. Like just not not stick anybody's neck out there too much unless I absolutely have to. So not move dash, you know, shoot the melted pistol unless like it's the absolute best thing to do. So I kind of try and play a game where I'm assuming I'm going to whiff a few key rolls. And with that assumption, can I still play good enough to win the game or what do I need to do to win the game? Assuming that two of my operatives at any given point over the course of the game are just going to do nothing and die. Um, and in a really tight competitive match, that probably will be the difference. But in a, in your mid level matches, like you can you can play well enough that you can play around those those you know misfortunes. It's kind of like in sports, you know, you have, you have to win the game decisively enough that bad referee calls can't like turn the game in your favor, which is kind of what the dice rolls are. And when it comes to corsairs, they do have basically a free floating APL in the form of light fingers that basically if you're playing positionally you can get a free shot you can get a free mission action that your opponent has to plan around at all times it's really good yeah on into the dark especially because that's basically even if you're playing you know capture that's a door open um it's that's such a huge such a huge play basically you know like you can stage your operatives you can teleport up and then all of a sudden this guy has like four apl you know he can like move and like the shade runner can move and slash someone and then also throw silent knives and then hit the button and then like do something else you like dash away if he hasn't already done that you know like it's it's pretty cool yeah the shade weaver is actually almost like a five apl operative on in the dark because you can open the door for free shade runner yeah oh you shade runner move through a person stab them which is kind of like a free fight action shoot them yeah and then just be everywhere I guess you could even technically on a hatchway, you could move past the hatchway, slash them, come back to the hatchway, and then hatchway fight. It's Correct. a normal move, unconceal. Yeah. And then if you had a third APL, you could also throw them with knives for, before or after. So I mean, that's a super niche scenario, but you you strike it's them a, once with relentless. It's enough yeah, to maybe he, get a marine or like a like a twelve yeah. health marine, not not like a big fourteen health intercessor, but maybe the twelve health night lords I mean, or phobos. I mean, if you hit you hit you hit a three or a five if you're lucky on combat because I think it is lethal five. So you take three off them on combat, pretty much, and you throw the knives. Maybe get two to four more damage, and then that's already like you know what seven to seven to nine damage you've taken off them before you fight, and then you just need three hits and then they're dead. I don't know. It's it's interesting, but on Into the Dark, they're re- they're really fast. Yeah. Um, and then one of the fastest they're... in the dark teams Be- yeah. because you have the extra APL, you have the teleport on turn one, and you've got the dreaded shredder shot into your opponent's back line where you can yeah. teleport, get a door open. And this is a standing thing for all players who have not played yeah. in the dark or don't really understand. Someone with four APL can get to your back line on any of the Always. teams that can do it. 
If you're playing against Corsairs with a Shredder, even if you don't think they can, you can get to them, whenever possible, just space out. Always, always, always space yeah, out. Like, space. Your team is going to look ridiculous scattered all over the place, but like you'll thank me when you're like, oh yeah, I didn't see that, and it could have cost me. Like I, I, We were playing a local, and I got um, Matt had, I think, three or four Gene Stealers in a row, like all the way in his back line. I set it up where that if I got the initiative, or even if I didn't, because I, I have a free door open, I was like, I'm going to get here. And it, it was just, it was rending, rending, rending. It was bad. It's the rendfactory.com. It's Rent really the 4 APL. Yeah. The 4 APL on In the Dark is specifically something that you can just depend on. Like, Higher Tech can do it, and Legionary can do it, right. where if somebody else opens a door, your 4 APL operative can cross a room, move yeah. dash, open a door on the other side, and then get a blast attack. So for right. anyone who's never seen it, just know, if you're ask your opponent, can I get to 4 AP? Can you get to 4 APL? And if they can, just... Just pre space for the blast. There's no reason to lose the yeah. game on turn one on in the dark, unless you really want to. If, if that's if that's what you're about, man. Yeah. Um, amusingly and slightly off topic, I have to shout out Compendium Guard, who you can calm somebody to have an extra APL, and you can also do free mission actions on your Scions, and you can also do this for APL deep backline shenanigans. Move, move, move. Take aim. Go nuts. Yeah. They can they have a ten inch move when they do it because they have move 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 reroll ones free free door open with the scion the scion vox person has given two guys plus one APL so two separate dudes can do this four APL door open shenanigan and to be honest they're swift enough to make Taylor jealous so anyways back on topic yeah that's one of the tricks that corsairs get to use but once you're playing you know players that are a little bit more precise what do you feel like you would be switching gears on for corsairs like you talked about being really really careful which pieces are you the most careful with which pieces are you trying to make sure make it to turn four if possible yeah that's i mean obviously the heaviest hitters but the heaviest hitters especially the guy with the three inch pistol you know the duelist um you're gonna have to get in someone's face eventually I think it the the pieces that I want to last till the end of the game highly depend on the mission, the terrain layout, and the opponent, right? So who's going to be the best into whoever you're playing, whether that's the plasma gunner or a combat specialist, for example, or the shade runners, since he can stay and conceal and abuse the terrain that's laid out in a certain way. So that'll that'll change based on the game. I think the biggest issue that I've struggled with with them personally, the way I play, is like who are your forward operatives? Who are the guys that are taking the midpoints and sticking their neck out there that if you lose the initiative, they're getting hit and they're going to die? So you don't have any chaff operatives. Everybody is good at what they do and everybody has a role. So a lot of times I've found myself using like the sniper with a with a concealed cloak on like, you know, a piece that, you know, that's an objective that's in the open that has light cover so he can be safe there. But like if I don't love putting the Karnathi or the Shade Runner out on a forward point, because if you lose the initiative or if you're doubling down your threats, one of them's gonna die. And I don't love that without them getting to do something. So a lot of times I'll potentially put my sniper out with his neck out there, or I'll put the um the birdman who can reveal you out there. Um those are the two I kind of go to. Although the Birdman, when he does reveal someone, just feels so good. It just is like when it works, it's like they're like, wow, OK, uh, you rolled your four up and now everybody's going to shoot at me. So I think that's that's the toughest thing, because like every operative loss, you really feel it. It's not just like a standard boy or a standard like, you know, dude who who cares? Like that's what they're there to do is like a guardsman's there to take the point and die. So I think that's been my biggest issue with the team. Um, Know, competitively is like who do you how do you stage your forward presence so that you can still get maximum value out of it because the orcs i used to just throw a couple boys out there on the points and you know if i lost them whatever but i probably wouldn't because they're just super durable the yeah. corsair is like if you get three hits against them in melee they're guaranteed to be dead and there's yeah, nothing you can like do. orcs you you have 11 models commandos you get what nine and like you had way more wounds so it is it is a lot more fragile of a team and the, the eight the eight wounds and a four up save and no way to like double parry or anything. I mean, the, the, I guess the Karnathi sort of can if you know if you're the attacker, but then you're not killing anybody. So that that's been my biggest struggle with the team. That and and recon to a certain extent, only because that's my play style. I've heard some people just kind of go for it and throw their models up there, but I like to play like hyper conservative and not give my opponents anything to do. One thing that I will say feels amazing is the new deadly ambush change. Uh, against shooting teams, like against Star Striders specifically, 
they just can't do anything. You can just move forward with impunity, and then when it comes time for the next turn, doesn't matter if they get initiative, if you're staged correctly, they will not be able to shoot you, period. And that that is like really, really, really nice. But against a melee team, or a team with enough melee operatives, it literally doesn't do anything at all, because they're going to want to charge you, so. Or even like six assault intercessors. That's like the nightmare, right? Just six dudes yeah. with 14 wounds pushing up to you that two shot you. So that's one of the worries for the team. And now that elites are kind of back in the meta a little bit with yeah. Night Lords, do you feel like they still have the tools to fight the new Night Lords team and kind of maybe some of the maybe Warp Coven pushing back into the meta? Because even Warp Coven, now the, well, the rubrics, yeah. when they go in, the rubrics go in and they can kill an elf just yes. as well as anything else because they're four four attacks on threes four four yeah i mean of the, all the people i'm maybe a bit more worried about night lords only because of the activation delay they can enable and also the the activation denying right so if they are like this is the eliminate guards and this is my attack up and i'm doubling down on that like even if i don't get an initiative like you can't go i'm gonna kill you there um and also later in the game if they do manage to chip away some of your operatives and it becomes somewhat you know, equal, then they can get the last activation. Because the thing that really, I've never really been concerned about elites overall with teams that have, you know, several more activations, because if you stage your threats correctly, sure, they can charge in and kill one of your guys. You, you'll you never give them two if you're playing good enough. If they kill one of your guys, you will have the last two to three activations to kill them with your plasma and your fusion pistol. So I'm not as worried about the standard Marines. Um, and not even really Night Lords, because they just have a standard save, no end bone with 12 wounds. But it's just, it's that kind of activation gaming that, or the activation gaming denial that Night Lords are able to enact, which worries me. Because typically with the teams that activate elites, like, you could just be like, all right, if you want to commit and kill this guy, like, I'm definitely going to kill you as long as I don't roll four ones. I want to take a quick in, in second response. to yeah. appreciate that you're just throwing out mega diamonds gems on like factions you don't even play um <laughs> it's just like great insight on all these different things like and then like as a night lord's player it's like oh yeah you gotta think about that you know i mean i mean he's been agonizing insight. over these things when he's playing on commandos on these top tables he's like oh my god <clears throat> what are the ways that my opponent can crawl out of this game that i need to find me basically right yeah yeah I mean, I also did. I mean, I started pl started with elites. Like, I I first came over from 40k playing Death Watch, so I started playing Compendium Death Watch, and I switched to Intercession. So I had a whole my first year of competitive play was all fan teams, and I was terrified the entire time. So just just remember that they're more scared of you than you are of them, <laughs> unless they hit your lines and there's three of them alive, and then they're not That's true. super scared. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. If they don't die, and sometimes they don't, because dice be dice, then you're like, oh well, I'm it's I'm dead. But average math, I I think elites will always somewhat struggle because teams are always going to have some AP two weaponry that can go last, and and delete and delete a whole space range usually. Yeah, I think that's actually one spot where the new buffs to warp coven have kind of pushed them back into relevancy, because now they're twelve wound models with good stats pretty much all the way around able to counter punch against elites with ap1 and they have all those tools to play the counter charge game because zangors if you take a bunch of zangors against the super melee focused teams you can ephemeral instability drop your opponent by an inch boost your zangors by an inch and then suddenly there's a two inch gap that you just hold the line against your opponent so i think i was actually talking with a canadian player george about the Warp Coven versus Felgor matchup, and I actually think that matchup probably feels a little bit better than it would have in the past when Ephemeral Instability, you had to do upkeep with an operative, because now it's just on. Yeah. Warp Coven's still one of those teams that, like, I I understand them a bit more now, because I've played them every so often, but I just, I don't even think of them. Like, they're just, they're just, they're just they just exist, and sometimes you're into them, like, oh, you play Warp Coven? That's okay. We I also don't have a ton of players in New York, in our local scene, that play warp coven all that often even though i think we have none we they, have, have, gotten, they none. have gotten much better i have a set of them but i don't have two rubrics so i actually can't play the list that we need to i could proxy them and i i probably will if we need to start practicing my first, other... my first ever kill team game was against your <laughs> warp coven when they just released in white dwarf and what did i take i took heavy, heavy intercessors death all unengaged and i was like they're space rings how they're fine let's do this hell yeah <laughs> it was over yeah. like end of turn one yeah yeah i think the changes to giving them all double shoot now the rubrics now basically do a pretty good job of just 
blowing up Space Marines because now you're four dice on threes, three, four, AP one all the time, and you always double shoot with them. So I actually heard from someone that they're not actually taking the Soul Reaper nearly as much in the elite matchups because you'd rather just double shoot and move. Yeah, sense valid. Um, yeah, I've got I've got a couple of questions lined up here. Um, one of them is. What drew you to Corsairs as a follow-up team after Commandos? Was it vibes? Was it play style? Was it something else? Was it the fact that they were already painted and uh, I had them? <laughs> I think that's Adrian, vibes. Maybe. I think that's Adrian vibes. famously in our group is like one of the slowest painters, so I think he agonizes over each paint job. And I think his I Death Watch intercession took like a year to finish every every model like for my, well the death watch guys i i have models that i've built and primed and weathered like ready to paint for probably almost a year and a half now and they're so intimidating because there's so much kit bashing and detail on them that i probably will never paint them um and it, and when i did paint some of them it would take me like seven days to do one guy so like i paint everybody i try to paint everybody to character standard and it's infamously just my achilles heel when it comes to the hobby but the elves were there and I was like, they're, but they're still fun. Like I, I genuinely like get excited every game to figure out the puzzle that is this team. I think they're like very balanced. Like if you roll hot on your dice, they're going to slap. But that's kind of like any team, right? Um, I think they're balanced because they don't have the rerolls. If they had reliability, it would probably be upper upper tier team. Um, but, but yes, to answer your original question, why I came back to them, I just was like, you know what, partially I had them and they're, they look amazing and they're fun to play. Partially, I just wanted to try something completely different from commandos. And partially I was like annoyed that I wasn't able to perform with them over a year ago. So I'm like, I can't just like give up on this. I need to prove that I can play these guys better. And, and it's just been, it's been fun. And every game I've had with everybody locally in Brooklyn, like, really tight games and like could have gone either way. And it just, it's like a very, it feels very rewarding when you win a game with them, because like I said earlier, it just is like, it feels like it, you saw an angle or you used the abilities better or your play was better, or you just got lucky and rolled sixes. And that feels good too. Sometimes. Do you feel like they feel substantially different from the other Eldar teams where you like that vibe more than something like Blades of Cain or Void Dancers or Mandrakes? Yeah, well, you know, Mandrakes I'm painting on right now, much faster, might I add, much faster. So they should be ready hopefully next week. Um, Mandrakes seem like fun to me, and I think I think I'm gonna like them because I love heavy cover as a commandos player. So I think that I will be able to use and seek out and abuse all the heavy cover to keep them in shadow and do some cool things. And I love movement tricks. So they seem fun to me. I haven't actually played as Blades of Cain or uh, Drukari or, um, sorry, Void Dancers, but I've played against them all a lot. Um, Void Dancers, I don't know why they, their vibe, just not not a big fan of the whole theater troupe situation. Never have been. Um, and yeah, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, I think they're OK, but they, they've never really drawn me as a team. The Dark Eldar thing is cool. But again, like the models, the lore, I've never been like. I'm not like a chaos, spiky, perverted elf kind of guy. I've always been a bit more on, you know, on the side of the emperor's light and all that, you know. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, yeah, I, the, the Corsairs to me, just like of all those factions and how I know them to play, having played against them, I, the Corsairs just seem to just be like really fun to me. Each model is a hero. They can do cool stuff. The free dash is really cool. Um, they have good ploys. They're, it's just like a really well-designed, fun, well-thought-out team, and the models are amazing. Like the, it's one of the best kits I think that, that GW released for the for the Kill Team series. Like so, so cool. And like they've been through a million rounds of balanced data slate, and they've barely been tapped at all. Which actually leads into one of my other questions. And you and you once again kind of tapped on this a little bit, but the deadly ambush seems like such an enormous. Like I was like. I feel like that might be like borderline bump them up a whole tier. It does, I think, against shooting teams, right? So so against a, a team that wants to charge you, it has literally no effect. Unless they're like dumb enough war. to run. Yeah, yeah. Unless they're dumb enough to run their one gunner up or up to you, you know, and then give them to you. But against a shooting team who only shoots you or wants to, if you're behind a barricade, wants to walk within two and shoot you, it is literally... 
it feels it feels like borderline illegal. Like I was playing a match against Star Striders uh, at a tournament last week and a local player, actually the guy who commissioned painted the team, really nice guy. Uh, and I it's and also Deadly Ambush is such a funny thing because it feels like such a gotcha and it feels so bad. Because like obviously if someone knew about it, they wouldn't do it, but everybody always forgets. So I'm there playing against Alex and he moves his like his uh what's what's the guy who double shoots the voids master right the void master void he master moves, niche moves his vo- he has this play and he's talking about it and he's super excited he's like all right i got the initiative i'm gonna give an extra apl to him i'm gonna move dash him up and i'm gonna blow up this guy then blow up this guy and your whole fight's gonna be gone and i was like all right and you kind of have to wait until they move dash and then like get their dice in their hands because if they move dash and you say i'm gonna am like oh well, i wasn't done with a move yet you know i'm gonna move back so he moves up there and I'm like, all right, dude, I have this ploy and now we're in combat. And he, I just saw the soul leave his body. And <laughs> since it was like, since I know him as a friend and it was a casual tournament, I was like, let's roll it back. Just do something, go up on the vantage and shoot me from up there. Like, don't just don't do that. Right. And he did. And it was fine. But like, it's one of those things that it like, cause that literally would have been the game. It would have been game over at that point, a hundred percent. So against shooting teams, it's so, so, so good. You could just, because that's what I said. My biggest issue with this team is how do you have those forward operatives and the midline objectives safe? How do you guarantee that you're not just going to get screwed if you lose the initiative and lose one of your best operatives? You know what I mean? So that's how you do it against you know shooting teams. You, you position yourself to the side of a light barricade so you can dash around it. Because if you're in the middle of the barricade, they might be able to game it where you can't quite get into combat effectively a four inch move because you have a three inch dash plus one inch engagement the shade runner can dash with fly so he moves straight through anything um it's it's really 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 good it's very good and the new outcasts yeah is really good too only being three inches now yeah that's, that's actually that actually comes to it an interesting topic from a high level tournament player how do you approach the topic of your big gotchas in a game do you announce them early on because obviously you know i've been in that situation where I'm like, well, you know, if you walk into a melee combat and you think you're going to be safe when I'm playing Pathfinders, I'm like, oh, I've told you at the beginning of the game, I can shoot into yeah. melee. But how? Do, where do you fall in those things? Because Deadly Ambush is such a powerful play that in a really, yeah. really high level competitive game, if your opponent gives it to you, you're going to want to take it. So how 100%. do you approach kind of giving your opponent enough off ramps where if they make the mistake, they made the mistake and it's not you funneling them funneling them into the mistake because i think those right. two things are actually the things that give people the most wariness about approaching really really high level tournament play because you really don't want to get felt like you're getting cheated and getting funneled into a gotcha definitely does feel more like you're getting cheated more often than it was a fair game yeah and it doesn't feel good like as the person doing it either and it, it's one of those things where i'm on part of me feels like i want to have a perfect game and i want my opponent to play perfectly and i want to play perfectly and who's the best person in that scenario however the opposite side of that coin is like in a competitive game like who can make the least mistakes and who can you know forget the least amount of rules and that's also something that is cool to try and see if you can optimize in the course of a tournament you know whose mind is more in tune and maybe like you know about deadly ambush but you just forgot in the moment and that's that's the sign of a, a difference in competitive play but as far as how i approach it i think it highly depends on the like the scenario and if it's a casual local tournament i will usually at the beginning of the game be like hey you know actually any tournament i'll be like hey do you know about corsairs have you played them before would you like me to run you through anything and if they say no i'm fine then great if they say yeah if you don't mind i kind of run through each operative give them the spark notes i give them the key ploys whatever um so then i tell them you know and if it's super super casual and they're about to walk into something like alex did we talk it out and i'm like dude just roll it back i don't want this to end like in a feels bad way but at a high level tournament it's highly situational i always before any game be like hey you know this team do you need me to tell you anything i'm never like look it up yourself so i'm always giving like hey like can i tell you what this team does blah 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 um whether or not you're like i can do this thing and this is really bad for you this is really bad for you i don't know maybe i just run through the ploys and let them figure out what's bad for them um but if i had explained it to someone already at a high level tournament and they made the mistake and this is we're talking like high level play i probably would just go through with it because like i said that that is like you know you don't want to have mistakes cost people games but 
that's how people lose games. So it's it's kind of a, a weird scenario. And and I'd say like depending on the level of the game, it, how I deal with that ploy varies based on the player, if I know them, what the scenario is, what's expected, that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean like so I had like a, a version of this where um, it was it was like pl- uh, an elite team playing against a horde team. Like I was playing Phobos and I was playing against Vetguard. And I put an operative out there, and I had an angle on two of my enemy's gunners, and I shot one. And then when it, I like when it came back around, that was like my second activation. I had four more. We ping pong back and forth a bunch, and then I was like, now "I'm going to Overwatch your other gunner." And then he's like, "You don't have an angle on that." And then I was like, "Oh, I looked careful. I thought carefully. I thought I did." And right. it's it's like it's such a hard balance of like if I call that out when I'm positioning it. It's like you can just I'm like, okay, I've got an angle on both of these gunners. It completely changes the arc of the entire battle round. Whereas like if if I don't call it out and then I and then like something got bumped and like it it now or like I was measuring to the wrong point or something and like something went wrong, it it all falls apart. So it's like, yeah, I think that kind of stuff is interesting, too, because like the more I play that, I mean, the less like the less information you give your opponent about what you're trying to do, obviously the better. But when it comes to like really key plays that you know you need to make sure you have and it's not obvious, like I'll always be like, look, like this is my intent. Let's get a laser out. Let's agree that this guy can be seen. And then if anything happens, you can go back to being like, look, like maybe this got bumped, but we agreed that this guy could be seen. We proved it with the laser, etc. Um, yeah, but that 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 is that is a bit of a that is a bit of a feels bad scenario, obviously, um, especially if there's like miscommunication. So that's another thing where I, I the, based on the tournament, based on the game, based on the vibe, like I will or won't communicate intent, you know, depending on how important the play is or depending on what level of play it is. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely feel you there. It's always something that I've definitely struggled with from tournament to tournament, just because different players expect different amounts of information. So I generally try to judge as early as possible. So when I set yeah. up at a table, I'll ask, how familiar with the team? Do you want a lot of detail, a little bit of detail or medium amounts of detail? How many of the gotchas do you know? Like, tell me how much you know about my team so I can reflect right. back to you all of the major things. And then I've at least worn them once, generally at the beginning of the game. And then right. throughout the course of the game, I'm like, all right, you sure you want to do that? And I'll give them off ramps where if they ask me a question, I will explain more. But if they're like, eh, it's fine. I'm like, all right, that's fine with me, too. You know, 100%. It's, like if, it's hard. Yeah. If your opponent asks, that, that's the, another it, weird thing, too, where it's like if your opponent asks you, it's like, how specific are they? Like, you can't just be telling them everything that you can do or want to do but if they ask me a specific question like obviously i'm gonna it's like hey do you have a ploy where you can do this and i'll be like yeah like i'm not gonna be like i don't know you look it up you know the rule like, yeah, the rule yeah. for me is the floor is if you ask me a specific question i will give you as much detail as you ask oh, 100%. me but i won't 100%. go any further at least when i'm doing high level tournament play because unfortunately for mis- like making mistakes making mistakes is part of the game like if your right. opponent mispositions and they're like oh i meant to be out of blast i'm like yeah but you're definitely one and a half inches away from that friendly model yeah. like the the, yeah. the mistake is now well past the margin of error if it was a millimeter off maybe i can believe you but yeah maybe but also but, that's the bla- yeah the blast is easy because all you have like it's obvious you're trying to space out for blast so just put a measurement tool down tell your opponent that's your intent boom takes two seconds so like the constant communication with your opponent is something that i do You know, I'm like talking the whole game and my opponent usually is, too. And that's how, like, you avoid these scenarios where it's a feels bad or is misinterpreted or this, that, the other. In terms of the gotchas, that's that's obviously a little bit of an issue because it's like you want to be able to use the ploy. And if you tell them once or twice and they forget, then it's kind of on them. Um, I mean, you you know, nobody's going to feel good about not being able to shoot once they thought they were going to shoot. But, you know, it's it is it is, you know, we are talking about sneaky elves. Or sneaky gits. Sneaky gets, yeah, sneaky gets. Although the orcs don't really have any feels bad ploys, they just have good ploys that everybody knows about. I think one of the big things for orcs or anyone with just a scratch variants is some of the melee math people, f- at least you know, at a more casual level, they haven't really thought through yeah. what it means to have a rosary or just a scratch effect. Like yeah. Void Master Niche with you know half damage one time and a rosary, he stands in the middle, blows a dude up, and you shoot him, you're like. Did he die? It's like not even not even a little bit. He's at six wounds. He's taken two wounds from your bolter and then he has ignored the other shot and he blocked the other two. You're like, all right, cool. 
what about the next one? It's like, well, he's probably gonna live through that too, and then he's gonna laser beam you. Yeah, but that that's so like when when you make the mistakes or when that stuff happens to you, for me, like that's how I learn best. If people let me take stuff back, I don't remember it. But when like you make a mistake or something crazy happens to you in game, you're like that operative. I now know he's legit, and so every other you'll never forget that after that moment. So it it is part of the evolution of being you know a, a kill team player, I think, and it's. I don't think it's a negative. I think it's it's a positive in terms of helping people remember and learn. Yeah. So like ultimately it really does boil down to just like more reps makes you a better player. And it's it's as simple as that. Yeah. I hundred percent. I mean that's really it. I mean it, it, I mean obviously there's a few other factors to it, but like the the biggest thing is like play as much as you can and play a lot of different factions so you ha- you have an idea of like what they do if you play a faction that you are struggling against you will i guarantee you, you will remember their rules better because you have to learn them yourself to play um and you'll get an idea of like what you might not want to face as that faction so yeah no as, as much as you can play like for sure that that's that's really the number one thing to to getting better at the game yeah um and travis had mentioned uh sneaky elves and sneaky gets which actually really connects one of the other questions i had Kind of tickling on something er- very earlier, you said that they're completely different teams. But I'm curious, is there, now that you've been playing Corsairs a little bit and you played Commandos a lot, obviously, are there any like parallels or like universal game truths that you've discovered from playing such a, a big spectrum? Just like things that, that really apply? Yeah, because you, you've gone from all the way elite with six intercession back when they were right. really good going all the way to Corsairs and then hopping all the way over to Commandos and then riding the Commandos all the way through last year. So yeah, yeah. it's three different sizes of team, three different durabilities of teams. So what have, yeah. what have you found? I know you talked about how you really like being cagey, but are, when does the caginess drop off? Like, what is the flipping point for you? Well, sometimes when I'm Corsairs, I'm just like, I, uh, this is so cool. I just want to do it. <laughs> like, and like, I, like I said, like I did, I saw a play with like, I was playing against Night Lords in the tournament the other weekend and I had the initiative and had my sniper on a point and he had a Marine position to get eliminate guards and his faction tack up that, uh, doubles down on that basically i forget what it's called but he was going to get two vp from it and i speaking of forgetting i forgot about his deny ploy so i was like all right i'm gonna go with this guy get him the hell out of dodge And he's like nope no you're not and i was like oh yeah right you can do that i was like all right well you know what i'm gonna do i have like two dudes with guns in this other room and i'm gonna go ahead and throw up my star storm duelist and shoot these two marines because i know you're not going to do anything about it right away because you want to kill this other guy and i did that and nothing happened <laughs> and then I was like, all right, uh, now I'm going to throw my plasma gun up there and try and double down because might as well. And then I like maybe took a few wounds off of Marine and it didn't really feel good. But I think that's when I probably I'm like, you know what? I just have to trust in the dice sometimes that they'll be there. And that's when I maybe am not Kate where I'm like, this could be huge. And I go for it. Um, but I don't know. Truth be told, that was also a casual tournament in a big tournament. I don't know if the caginess ever comes off. Unless I am behind and I have to do something crazy to win. If I know I'm going to lose, then you have to think out of the box. If it's a tight game or it's a one-point game or maybe you're even playing for a tie in a very high-level game, I don't think I ever stop being cagey. It's just how I play. I don't like losing models. <laughs> um, I don't like giving my opponents free stuff to kill. Uh, and I think at, at the end of the day... <clears throat> I think what I've realized about competitive kill team in a lot of ways is like when you're at a higher level of play, like taking away options for your opponent is one of the most powerful things you can do. And some teams have ploys that do that. But if they don't, just based off of your play, if someone like, how can I deny one point of my opponent's secondaries, right? How can I deny this eliminate guard? How can I position smartly where with Corsairs and the free dash, I don't have to end any turn on a point when I'm looting it. I can stay off it against Marines because I know if they walk onto it through APL, they're going to get it anyway. And at the beginning of the turn, they have no potential eliminate guards to choose. Stuff like that. Um, you know, if... if uh, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know if the cageness ever comes out. You know, you can take the cage out of the player. You can't take the player out of the cage. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> I mean, there's 
playing ahead like so there's a concept in magic the gathering and probably in some other games where when you're playing ahead your goal is to stymie as many of the possible win winning positions for your opponent out of the game like if i don't have to give you a kill why would i give you a kill if i have a game plan that wins me a game all the way through and recon is one of the attack op archetypes where you can score most of your stuff without touching your opponent you can play cagey you can wait for a hole to open you can run a dude plant transponder and because on corsairs you get a full move dash you can always have one operative do plant transponders on a board edge if you've cleared off that board edge because most teams you have to be more than six inches away to score the second half of plant transponder corsairs you get nine inches of move or ten inches of move if you're doing eldari agility 11 actually with agility they get a dash and uh which which was a a surprise for one of my opponents where he was like you can move how far now i was like yep i at that point in your back line they don't shoot you touch as long as i don't shoot you i could go anywhere it was a points grab it was a last minute loop that ended up winning me the game and i was like yep 11 inches baby yeah but when you're behind, you have to find riskier ways that your opponent can't really predict. And you have to throw a little bit more dice and hope that you go roll a little bit hotter. Because when you're behind, you need to find ways to catch up where your opponent can't catch up in time. So like in Magic the Gathering, when you're behind, you're looking for what is the most ridiculous line of right. drawing three cards in a row. Because in most cases, if you draw an even game, you're going to lose the game. Yeah. Right. But if you're behind, you're like, all right, I need two plays to go well. And if they go well, you're back in it. So Corsairs definitely have the ability to play KG, play super defensively, use your move dashes to hide behind all of your objectives, stay out of the way. But when you conversely need to switch gears and go risky, you also have the operatives to go risky. You've got the Kranathi who can go first and parry. You've got the double shooter and you've got a plasma with or a shredder in a lot of cases. That can risk it all to blow up three guys. Yeah, and if you have a few CP to double down on some rerolls if you need them. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing where, like, if there's a play where in a normal game where you're tied or, or winning by one point, that you're like, on average, this is not a good play because if I roll average and they roll average, I will not kill these people. But if you're behind, you're like, look, I need to roll four hits and they need to roll no saves. And if that happens, one save. I'm back if it, Like, you can plan around, like, what is... Right pretty bad luck for them and good luck for me and i need one or two of those and if you get those suddenly the game is even again and that's like that's really where the good players are made because medium players give up but you can't give up you need to find the lines that get you a win in a position where in most cases you would lose like i had a game at kasserkin last year in december where i won a monthly where i was like well i've got three kasserkin against three marines in most situations the game is over But because I have a plasma guy on a point and I have a comms guy still alive, the plasma guy has three APL. He can go grab the point that he's standing on. He can blow up a Marine with a plasma gun and he can charge and lock up the last Marine. And if he does that, the Marine can't do enough. And I just have to win initiative. So I have to win one dice roll, roll hot on a plasma and the Zinch, the Zinch Legionary has to die. And you know what? It all worked out and I won by like two points. But if you don't see that line, the game is over. It did. It did ha- a similar thing happened to me at the, the World Championships in Atlanta when I had the Commandos Mirror, where uh, I basically um, I was playing Wallace, right, Wallace West. Yeah, from and Spain. I he yeah he this was back when Commandos had the triple four deploy, so it was on loot. He won the roll off. You know, he chose Defender. He triple four deployed, locked me out of anything, and he just played an amazingly tight first turn where he got a four two and it wouldn't even lose an operative, and so. I had, I was like the only way I win this game if, is is if I just start doing some serious damage. So my last activation, I yoloed my bomb squig forward behind a door, and I was like, if I lose the initiative, he kills my bomb squig, and I'm probably out of this game. If I win the initiative, he comes through that door, and his blast can hit three orcs, and I also need all of those orcs to die. And you know what? It happened. The bomb squig went off, and I rolled two crits and a hit with the ploy each time and three orcs were just dead and all of a sudden i was back in that game and i still only won the game i think by like one point but like that was the line that was like i i think i'm gonna lose this game but if this happens like i might have a chance and like that and that and hey it worked the dice the dice were there the dice god the dice gods are with me that day 
Yeah, there's definitely a concept of finding the line that I think needs to come up more often because finding the line is probably some of the most fun parts of playing any really, really high level competitive game because you see like a single path. You're like, I'm down two points. I've got I'm down two operatives. This one guy who can be a hero who has a three APL, he's got to do four APLs worth of work. How can I best do that? And when you find those lines and thread the needle, it feels really cool because winning while you're ahead is an exercise in playing well but right. winning while you're behind is finding the one chance and all the possibilities where you're basically guaranteed a loss to find a way to win and also having some good dice luck too i think the um and and in the interim if, if like you know that line's not apparent i think the thing that i find myself doing a lot or thing you like anybody can do is just like think about like all right it's my turn to go like first of all i usually think about who needs to go first this turn who wants to go last right so you always know like what your bookends are and the middle can change but at any point during the middle you look at the board state and you say okay what's like the biggest bang for my buck i can get right here what is a thing that i can do that will net me the most profit you know and and with with the least amount of loss and like that's kind of the the mantra with which I approach all my games, where like at any given point, what is the best possible move I can make? You don't even have to think about the score. You don't even have to think about what it will get you. You just know that that's the best thing you could do. And then the points fall into place after that. Yeah, I I come in a lot of games from a operative trading perspective, because if you can trade positively for these wider teams, because I played Pathfinders, I've played some of the other wider teams. If you can trade positively over a long period of time, you'll win most games. For Jason with his crazy Doom Bolter, which, you know, for anyone who's watch it, who watched our tier list, you know, give us some cool Doom Guy stories. Jason's whole thing with the Doom Guy is if you send five dorks out into the open, one of them dies, the other four make it into your opponent's line, and the one single guy in the background is just double tapping people. So he's going to yes. trade up, I think, like four to one. I think while we were at LVO, me and you were just watching Jason like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm undefeated. So we're like, I don't understand, but I, I trust that what you're doing makes sense. Yeah, but I your wanna, whole thing, really Jason, is, is sacrificing the one guy to get your opponent to spread out, basically, and then have those other guys hit your opponent's line. And then whatever's left is just getting blown up. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like the Doom guy intercession build is like pretty much like the 100 percent like play style and like philosophically and every single thing is like 100% the opposite of everything you've ever said in any podcast we've had you on Adrian it's it's just like turn yeah. one like put them on the back foot people are trying to play the delay game and you just like you lean into that and and like feed off of that and it's like when people are like oh my gosh I'm gonna out activate you and then you put them in a pickle like ASAP and then they're like okay well I've got time to respond and then you just instantly double down on like pickle town and like hit them with some more heat and like if you can do it right um you can really really put people in a jam and just like mess them up and then they're like oh man I've got to step on and do something to fix this and then when they do doom guy slays them all because it's honestly not that hard for doom guy to kill three people a turn with no penalty in overwatch you put your your doctrine rerolls specifically on him and then you position him so that he can kill he's got like a 90 something percent chance to like kill anything that he like looks at per shot so he doesn't need to double tap anyone. He just single taps this guy, single taps this guy, rolls back around to Overwatch. It's like if he didn't kill one of them, he cleans them up. And if he did kill both, he cleans up a third. And it's like such an efficient way to play elites. It's beautiful. Yes, yeah, I, I would love to see it in person, like next time we're, we're in the same room. Like I, I got to see because like in my head, I'm still like... But why would people give you targets to shoot at? But maybe maybe they just... They're not used to intercessors running at you on the full engage and they just panic and <laughs> do weird stuff. Yeah. But that's like yeah, true. It, it's it's but also like maybe you just see it in a different way that I do. Cause I like I, I have played like four custodians before and just run at people for fun. And I'm like, I just hope my stats hold. But I'm it's just so like what you're describing is just like so against like how I <laughs> see and approach the game. Yeah. But I love I love that it works though. I love that like people can find different lines it work. to play the same team. I know we, I was there. We were there. We saw it work. <laughs> we shot we shot a whole vlog between yeah. us and Can You Roll a Crit where we're just like, Yeah, every week, every day. We're like, Oh yeah, Jason's still out here undefeated. Yeah. Yeah. Just running at people. I've got to do a tiny baby shout out to to the the same concept I did at Adepticon, where I brought Phobos 
And I, I used even fewer conceal orders, and it went even Whoa. better. Um, oh so it was God. just six cursors on engage, and it's absolute just horrifying violence. That's so good. Yeah, Jason's, it's Jason's so out good. here playing kill team, and the rest of us are playing points team. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Anyways, one of the things that I wanted to approach, you know, with you, because one of the big things at tournament play is how do you manage your time? You know, I know in the past, you know, you've run afoul of running into some of the two hour time blocks. I know at LVO, you played a clean tournament where you basically managed to stay just within the time boundaries. And locally, you know, you've been better as of late. So one of the things I wanted to ask is how did you feel about time when you were a newer player and how has that evolved over time and how would you tell people who are kind of on the fence about going to tournaments because they're worried about time like how would you yeah. how would you give advice as a high level player i think i mean starting like at, at the local like community level like if you're sitting down from someone you just need to establish like what kind of game you want to have and who needs to be there when and a lot of times when i'm playing practice games or casual games and we're just kind of discussing things and talking and having a beer and joking around like we'll play like easily three hour games like in terms of when you move on to the tournaments and stuff, it's been an interesting thing that like I think we've kind of seen evolve because the game is still in this edition approaching the end of its infancy, I'd say. And the chess clock debate was a big thing last year. Like chess clocks weren't really on many people's radar for the first year, I'd say, or the first two years. And and then in, in, in last year in 2023, it was it was a big thing that a lot of TOs were enacting, a lot of tournaments were aware of. They had rules packets specifically how to use them. Um but yeah, sorry, I lost, I lost track of the question. The question was, how would, how would you talk to players about managing their time? At a how would you tournament? help players, yeah. you know, approach the issue of time? Because obviously yeah. the West Coast, the East Coast, and the rest of the world has had varying amounts of time at their tournaments. I think French right. tournaments have hour and a half rounds or maybe an hour oh, wow. and 45 yeah, minute rounds, which is really crazy. Yeah. I think at some point, some U.S. tournaments were doing two and a half hour rounds. I think most of us have flattened out around two hours, which is enough yeah. to play, I think, a reasonably tight four four rounds but a lot of players do run afoul of the two hour time limit a lot yeah. of players are playing two and a half hour games if that generally though you know you've hit you've been at the two and a half hour mark and now more recently you've been at the two hour mark right. how have you approached the change and how would right. you help players who are a little bit on the slower side how would you tell them to like adjust yeah. their gameplay I think the biggest thing for me is is what we talked about before is like get the reps in be be familiar with your team because if, if you're spending time looking up what ploys are, what your operative stats are during the game, that's all time in a clock scenario that you're wasting. So you need to know your team to a T. Like you just need to know all the stats. You need to know everything they can do. You need to have it like cataloged in your brain. And what that also does, it allows you to focus on your opponent's team in game. You can really start seeing the strategy more and what you want to do. Because if if you don't know your own team's rules, you can't even think about what your opponent could be doing. So that's number one. I'd say be really familiar with the team and, and know everything you want to do. I think for me, too, because I've always taken a lot more time proportionally to other players in my setup, and I'm really careful in particular with my deployment. So as quick as you can deploy your operatives, and and you know, if 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 your opponent's choosing tack ops and getting equipment and you're already done there, just start getting your groups down and start thinking about where these guys are going in their deployment groups. So when it comes time to do deployment, you can go boom, 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 hit the clock, back to you. Because I've I've been down in some scenarios like five or maybe even seven minutes at times in a really bad scenario in just deployment and so then you're starting the game on an on a time deficit when it should be about equal and then you're looking at the clock and you're worrying and you're making you know more mistakes or thinking more about the time so so number one know your team number two get your deployment done quick and then in game uh you know you just need to practice with clocks just as you practice with your teams so if you're prepping for a big tournament where there are going to be clocks used i would recommend getting comfortable with them because the biggest thing that happened to me first was i just forgot they were there or i forgot to hit the button and you know technically it's not my opponent's job to to remind me or tell me even though it is a nice thing to do um so remember and just get in the habit of okay i'm done boom hit the clock okay i'm done boom hit the clock it just it, it just has to become like muscle memory at that point um and also, since, you know, I, I am a bit more of a, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a heady kind of player. I take my time. I think I consider all my options, which in a two hour time limit game can 
lead me into some difficult scenarios where I, you know, either end up going over or just barely finish on time. But I think you need to learn when to, to pick and choose which activations you you need to spend that time on and what is maybe extraneous thinking that isn't necessarily beneficial or, or won't yield the highest like net positive result. So if there's something that you're like, oh, I could be a little bit more optimal here, and you're thinking for two minutes about how optimal you could be, but it really doesn't matter in terms of the bigger picture, just make the move good enough, hit the clock back, because you want clock at, you know, in turns like three and four when it really matters. Um, so I think those are the biggest things for me, but I also would say that look like, you know, if if you have two hours, like, I'll use the two hours. So like, as long as you're aware of how long you're going to take, the more you play, you'll get an idea of like how long it's going to take you on turn one, two, three, four with your clock. Like use the time when you need to use the time. Like say there's a huge move turn two that will have big implications. If you need to take your time there, take your time there. You just need to be comfortable turns three and four really speeding up because you've lost five or six minutes of your time at that juncture. I guess those are my probably biggest takeaways. And uh, yeah, I, I think historically I have been a bit of a slower player and I ran in some situations and I got, it was disappointing, but then I kind of was like, all right, let's suck it up and get better and do this. And so far we've, we've been good. Yeah. I think being able to figure out when decisions are important, that's probably one right. of the harder skills, right? Because it's very easy in kill team to think that every single thing is going to be the entire game. But when you're playing Corsairs, it's like, oh, I need to move some dude up into the front. It probably shouldn't be the gunner. It probably shouldn't be the leader. Like, there's no reason to even consider some of the models when you're going right. into, like, looking at the whole skew. It's like, you're playing Commandos. You've got your forward to play guy. You're not moving him on turn. Like, you're not going to move him in the first half of the turn. So, like, just focus on the people that you do need to move. And being able to do that quickly is definitely a function of having the rep reps in. And right. like, honestly, when it like with that example specifically, when it comes to choosing who's going to be your front operative, that's probably a choice that you make and decide and stick to before the game starts. Where it's like it's a known thing, like the Shade Runner right. is pretty good because you can deadly ambush over a barricade or something like not an expert, right. but that's my first impression, for example. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of that kind of stuff is is just like you make choices ahead of time and, you know, it's like strategy level. Yeah. And I think that's that's definitely like one a variable of like getting the reps in with your team. But also the more you play, the more you can show up to a table and take a few minutes looking at it and not only determine which side is better for what you want to accomplish, but probably where operatives are going to go in the first couple turns. So, you know, and that can all be you can be thinking about that before the game starts and before everybody's on clocks while you're selecting equipment or attack ops or deploying you know spreading up your operatives in groups or barricades or whatever like that all that time should be used in a clock setting like there should be no time you're like oh like it's his turn to put a barricade i'll just tune out like you should be using that time to be like who's going first what ob what objective am i taking with who who's my second line who's my first line and so yeah that and that will help you move a lot faster in turns one and probably two as well yeah, netting you some extra time for turns three and four. One of the teams exactly. I actually, so at LVO, actually, I ran into this. Teams with a lot of spare movement actually do take longer to play, and you have to have a plan for all of that movement up front. So, like, because Pathfinders play with Recon Sweep, there's, like, a whole two-minute block that just gets lost at the beginning of every strat yeah. phase where it's like, I'm going to take a bunch of dashes. And you have to yeah. go through and do them super quick, and you have to have a plan ahead of time. And in those tough games, those dashes can end up adding up. So I think I ended up at LVO. I timed out against one of our one of the opponents, but he wanted to play the rest of the game. I think it's fine. I would be happy taking the loss here because it's absolutely his win. And I spent probably an actual like six minutes dirtling around with recon sweeps while trying to figure out a way to like catch back up into the game because I was basically stuck in a poor position because I had taken a more conservative line on playing not playing Montcaw and I lost my leader as a in response and then i was stuck on the back foot back foot using recon sweep to cover up the deficiencies yeah there's those ploys like same with the commandos where it's like i have this one ploy and i'm gonna move all of my operatives like that that'll take a chunk out of your clock it does eat time and you do need to think about that when you're playing on clock like it's not because one of the things that comes up is when you go from no clock play to clock play all of yeah. this stuff that you feel like is pretty quick actually is not quick and you can right. see it on the clock 
And it's only fair for your opponent to get a fair amount of time. If you're going to play on clocks and that's what people want. I don't think at GW events, that's really where they're at right now. But I think for other events, people do want the conception of a fair game. And that is even time. Yeah, it, it's a weird, it's a weird thing because it's like it's not it's not a perfect solution. But at the same time, not no game in a tournament is perfect because there's a schedule and there's time pressure and there's places people got to be and you got to fit a certain amount of games in per day. So there's always going to be some some like imperfection, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I've I've grown at first. I didn't love the idea of clocks, you know, maybe a year or so ago. But I've I've come over to to team oh, clocks even, so. even like four months ago. <laughs> Yeah, I guess yeah. The end of what end of last year, I just uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's a harsh reality to face when you're when you end up timing out, and even if even if it's close, and you lose the game because of a deficiency of you know I don't know, maybe even whether it's ten seconds or two minutes, you know that feels close to me. But like you know that those those are the rules, and it's a hard stop. It's just is is interesting because kill team is like not like a hard stop rule set. Um, but like the clocks introduce a very hard stop mechanic to it. So I, I, it's been an interesting like evolution for me to go from like, I don't like clocks to I'm not doing well in clocks to, all right, I see the point. Like I, I get why we want to have a fair game and like, all right, let's, let's play faster and do better. And like, actually now that I'm on clocks, like I don't mind that experience as much anymore. And it's a new, it's a new challenge. It's a new dimension of the game and your skill set to hone. And I've actually enjoyed enjoy that challenge after i you know got over the hurdle of of uh, uh some definitely Getting some burned. some hard hard losses when when i did time out to my own fault you know but it is what it is that's that's the experience of uh of learning and becoming a better player yeah i mean honestly it's pretty much like any other situation where all you got to do is learn the hard lesson once like getting caught in a blast it's kind of the same thing with the clock but like people aren't really like you know, like the <laughs> chess clock being a factor in losing a game does not come up in casual games. Like it's it's not in a lot of tournaments. So it, so it's like not oh, a lot of people not. having to learn that lesson. But 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 when it comes down to it, like in a situation with clocks, it is pretty much just that. Like you just got to learn that lesson once, just like getting blasted. Yeah, and I think most people, even in tournaments where there aren't clocks, and there maybe should be, like. Sometimes people are playing elites and sometimes people are playing a, a 15 man horde and like that 15 man horde will take more time, but the game will still finish on time. And like, are people OK with that? You know, like, I don't know. Some players are totally fine with that. Sometimes you get to turn three and people will talk it out, although I don't re recommend talking it out. But some people do that at tournaments. Uh, some people will end up playing the last turn very rushed because one person took more time. But it's hard to say because there wasn't a clock. So I think. For me, and, and going back to like what we talked about earlier, where it's like what you would recommend to people going to like a big tournament. So if we're going to a big tournament with clocks, I would say if you don't know your opponent, I would just say and, and you're concerned about time, just 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 use, you know, it's it's kind of a weird conversation to have. It's a little bit awkward at first because we'll feel like attacked potentially, but it's not a personal attack. It's just the game. So there were a few times where I've rolled up to someone and we've both been like, oh, like, we're fine. We're not going to time out. And then I've played that person. And they've actually taken a significantly longer amount of time. And it's forced me to then have to rush in the last turning point, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure the same can be said vice versa on my side. So if you don't know the person, I would just say, just go on a clock. And then there's no, you know, and if you're better at the clock, help help your opponent, remind them, hey, you know, hit the time back or hit it back to me or whatever else or help them manage it. But um, at, a bit, at a big tournament, when you start getting further and further into the, you know, the, the top 10 if you're undefeated after a while like the clocks do start to really matter and it can be a, a, a feels bad uh if you know if your opponent takes a lot more time than you or, or you take more time than them and, and the game comes down to that and you have to have that awkward conversation yeah i will call out that dakota's mission or packet for lvo calls out that when you are switching clocks over you want to announce your opponent that you're switching and i actually right. did find that to be a good way to kind of help bridge the gap for experienced mm -hmm. players and less experienced players because at least then players aren't getting to abuse the clock you're like all right i'm switching time for you and it is the more experienced player's job effectively to be an arbiter when you are on the clock against someone who's maybe mid-skilled or hasn't used it because really at the end of the day if you're going to be a dick about it it's just going to make everyone have a less fun time 100 percent. and i mean that's that's just like the general rule for anything in kill team just like it's it's a small community 
we're all here at the end of the day to play a game with toys that we paint and have fun. So like everybody should just be as chill and nice as possible and just consider it in all scenarios, you know, explaining your rules, explaining your gotchas, if it's that kind of game, right? Reminding people that maybe this is what you do. Saying, hey, clock's on you, clock's on me, or hey, I saw you forgot to hit the clock, make sure you hit the clock back to me, that kind of stuff. So it's it's just like be a, be a good person and help and and you know, have 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 some grace, have some tolerance and and help everybody grow as a community. Cause like it is small and you will run into people again. So it's it's nice to just like, you know, help help people along because you never know when when you'll be face to face with them at the table again. And you want to have a, a fun gaming experience, even if it is competitive, yeah, you still want to have really a, a good like, time. It is a game. We are playing this to have fun. And if you're trying to like crush the fun out of like somebody, you're probably not doing it right. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be a few people like that, but yeah, it's not, it's not the vibe that, that I'm going for. And we heard that from the world champ. <laughs> Any uh, upcoming tournaments, Adrian? I know, you know, at least locally, we'll have the New York open later this year. Save the dates. Mm-hmm. Anyone for uh, later in October, I'm running ACO. I'll be running the Goonhammer open in June. So there's lots or in July, actually Goonhammer open is going to be early July. ACO is middle of June. There's going to be a lot of tournaments. What are you looking forward to in your competitive season? Any travels, many, uh, any world plans? <laughs> Right. Well, right. Yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe. I mean, we're there's there's a WTC uh, country tournament happening in Belgium in uh, August, I think. And there's been some some chatter around potentially attending that. So I got to see if that's in the cards. That would be very cool to to represent Team USA along with uh, you know a handful of other other top US players. Um, in the meantime, though, like I said at the beginning of this, I've actually just been really enjoying like taking a step back because last year was pretty intense and, and I loved every second of it. But it's been nice to just get back to the hobby, get back to playing some fun teams that aren't S tier that I just enjoy playing and painting um, and just playing some locals and playing with the friends and the community we have here. And I know that, you know, in a month or two, I'll come back to my, you know, I'll be like, all right, vacation's over. Let's get back to competing again. <laughs> you know, it's just like I need a little bit of a break. But what's on my specific radar is definitely Nova. I'll be attending Nova. Um, other than that, I don't really know. I'm going to try and make it out to Kill Scream uh, on the West Coast in uh, October, I believe. Uh, I'd, I've, I've been invited out and I'd love to go. So that would be really cool. I've never been there. And they have amazing art and merch and trophies. And, and just the vibe over there is really great. We met a lot of them at LVO. Um, and then NYO, obviously, uh, this year, I think I will be TOing and making some really kick-ass video for the tournament and I will not be competing in NYO. So the golden, the golden chain sword will be handed down, bestowed upon someone else like the Stanley cup this year. Um, and I, I, I will, I will gladly pass it along, but that, that should be really fun for the third year of NYO. And then, oh yeah, of course, world championships in Atlanta, duh. <laughs> So that's yeah, because so, so, the top yeah. eight from last year's world championship automatically got another entry, and obviously you were in the top eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so and so you that, were that top was... one ITC, getting a, a whole year's worth of free kill team product. That, that's true. I I got all the plastic for a year, which is awesome. So which is which is why I have my mandrakes on the uh, on the painting table right now, uh, which is honestly just such a, such a cool such a cool thing. It feels really really awesome, and I'm so happy that GW is like investing in in that in a way it's just a cool kind of you know achievement to unlock so to speak um but yeah the i'm really excited for atlanta again this year and i think that will probably be like starting with no like around nova time i'll probably start my like proper like all right who am i taking who am i practicing with let's get the sparring partners let's get the matches in but for the next for the next month or so maybe two months i'm just kind of like i'm just chilling having a good time having fun with the game again and 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 trying to find who the next team is because I'd, I'd like for it to not be commando because <laughs> uh, i don't think i can do much more green other than warp fire right now on my mandrakes time to pick up uh the doom bolter and play no, some intercession I, I again i do i playing elites for a whole year scarred me i don't know if i can do it again it's so it's just you live in constant fear of ap2 weaponry Oh, he doesn't. He just has five know, targets. Well, so the AP I, gun I, gets I, one guy, and then and then you pull out your gun. You have tactical doctor, and you blow him up with with P one. Maybe, maybe it's because you know the theory how like the person who just like 
is not timid and runs across traffic will never get hit by a car but the person who's timid is just going to get hit like i feel like that's me with the lead so i'm like i'm a cagey player i don't want to do that and then if i do it and i'm going to be like all right i'm going to try this strategy i'll just get i'll just get wiped off the board <laughs> like i will say just... that it might actually be a good point of everyone who's listening if you want to learn how to play better you do need to be able to incorporate more than your play style in to the game because at 100%. some point you need to be able to see like when can i be more aggressive and where can you change it up because if you're always cagey maybe you miss out the times where being really aggressive would get you a win because you just 100%. don't see them because you haven't played those yeah. lines and i'm not so. saying there aren't times where i am aggressive but i pick and yeah. choose but what i'm saying is when i when i say cagey i don't mean timid i when i say cagey i mean like how can i maximize all of my resources and deny my opponent as much as possible like when i say cagey i guess i mean optimally you know everything i do is calculated down to like the the half an inch is to like even if i'm running up to a barricade i don't just move dash and put my model anywhere behind a barricade do i want to be in the center do i want to be on the right do i want to be on the left do i want to be exactly an instrument so they can't me from the other side like all that stuff is calculated and that that's i guess what i mean to clarify kg as opposed to just like kind of move dash good enough back to you yeah it's it's like you'll happily give up one victory point and like an important piece to get three victory points back later exactly exactly it's not like i don't want to lose any of my models if it's going to net me a you know a better result like I, i'm trying to see the, the game long term and like who can i afford to lose but th i just don't like to throw anybody away haphazardly and maybe that's my issue with the intercessors on full engaged thing but hey man if you're telling me it's working and and, and everybody's blowing everybody up with bolter fire i might have to try it i would love to i would love to i just want to observe a game like we've heard the stories i just want to sit with with a beer and i just want to watch i just want to watch you cook <laughs> i have experienced it so can't oh, confirm okay. the six and cursors does does work against mandrakes okay. okay six and cursors works against like basically everyone honestly yeah all right all right adrian thanks for coming by the podcast hopefully this is definitely one of our longer episodes so hopefully everybody's enjoying some of the deep thoughts of a corsair player a former commandos player the deep thoughts of a world champion yeah right on, on a team that uh he probably won't continue playing for too long but they're really really fun and i like them a lot and it's been a, it's been an interesting challenge to try and figure out how to maximize a team that can be such a glass cannon so I've, I've really enjoyed that and it's it's nice to just change it up every so often well thanks for coming on absolutely and thank you listeners for listening until the end and as a little bonus to our patreon subscribers who made it all the way to the end thanks to the new subscribers i know we haven't done a call out earlier in the episode but we did just get a new subscriber leaf thanks for joining welcome to the inner circle leaf you made it. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. It's been a lot of fun chatting.